If you've worked with Excel as a data source for Power BI before, you know it's actually one of the trickier sources to work with. It's more prone to errors. For example, people changing things in the file can break your report refresh. Scheduling refresh on the file sources isn't the most intuitive thing in the world either. So that's what we're gonna focus on today, strategies for the smoothest possible experience that you can have when using Power BI with Excel. Let's start with the basics. There's two connector categories for working with files in Power BI. There's your file sources, of different types. And then there's two more for folders, local folder and SharePoint folder. You'll notice that there's no single file SharePoint connector, but you can still connect to single files in SharePoint. I have a video in my channel on how to do that. I'll link it in the description. When you're choosing between SharePoint and the local options, really it's about how you wanna schedule refresh on it. If you wanna be refreshing a data model based on a file source, the best place to put those files is in SharePoint Online. That'll let you refresh without using a gateway. Have a video on that too. I'll link that in the description, but let's talk about the single file connector first. Most people who are using files as a source are working with Excel files. And the thing with Excel files is that you really, really, really want to have a table inserted around your data. So what that does is it gives you a named table to connect to here versus connecting to the whole sheet. I'll show you how to do this in a second. All right, so here's my Excel file. This is intentionally simplified for the sake of example. What we wanna do here is insert a table around our data. I can click a cell here and do Control A to automatically select everything. And then I go to the Insert tab in the ribbon and click on Table. Leave the box checked for my table has headers if your columns have headers. Tables in Excel are really useful. They let you control aspects of your data more at a column level versus individual cells. Your calculations will auto fill down your data validation will automatically apply to the whole column. You get sorts and filters, it's very nice. But what we're really interested in here is to tell Power BI exactly where our data is because people will do things like inserting rows above here and say, please do X, Y, Z. And that kind of thing will break your data set refresh. What you may also want to do while you're in here is lock your column headers. So Power BI will reference your data by column name. So if somebody edits your column names, it won't be able to find them anymore and it will throw an error. The data protection features in Excel are a little bit funky. What you need to make sure you do is unlock the things that you want people to be able to edit when you're trying to lock specific things down. Otherwise, people won't be able to edit anything. So I'm gonna select all my data again and then go to the right-click menu and choose Format Cells. Hopefully it's not off the bottom of my screen recording. It's at the very bottom of the list. And then choose under the protection tab, uncheck the locked box. So that's gonna unlock it. And then we want to lock back down just the headers. So select the headers, right click, format cells, and set that to locked. In order for this to apply, we need to turn on the sheet protection feature. So that's in the review tab in the ribbon. And then click on protect sheet. Check the boxes next to the things you want people to be able to still do. So I don't really want people deleting columns. I'm gonna leave that one unchecked, but check most of the rest. The delete rows thing is funny. I haven't seen that actually work properly. Like if, even if you check this box, people won't be able to delete rows, just has a heads up. Don't put a password here. If you put a password here, Power BI won't be able to connect to it. And then click okay. So now when I try and double click this column to rename it, it says that you can't because it's in a protected sheet. That's what we want, but we can still modify these other values. So like, for example, I can do this, I can add a row in here, that kind of thing. And here's what I mean with the deletes being weird. So remember I left the box checked for being able to delete rows, but if I right click this and try and delete it, it says that I can't. I don't know if this is a bug or what, but it's weird. All right, so we're ready to go. I'm gonna save this and then connect to it in Power BI. So back in Power BI Desktop, I'm gonna to go to Get Data, Excel Workbook. There's also a button for it in the ribbon and six other places. So I'm gonna choose my workbook and you'll notice that I have an option of selecting the sheet or the table. I always wanna select the table because that's the one that is going to ignore any other text that people put in and around the table. This one, for example, you can see that the note that I added above the table gets pulled in and then it makes up random column names for other things. So we're gonna to connect to our table and then go to transform data. Here's our query. We are going to move on to talk about the folder connector now. The folder connectors are going to be what you want to use to combine a bunch of files that have the same data structure. So say you get a CSV every month. 
you want to combine all of those into a single table. If I go to new source and then more, my options are folder and SharePoint folder. We're gonna talk mostly about the SharePoint folder option today. So if I search for SharePoint, it'll pop up. So this one here, this will work for both on-premise and SharePoint online. And what it wants is a site URL. This will work with OneDrive or shared SharePoint sites. Generally speaking, it's better to use a shared SharePoint site versus OneDrive because your OneDrive gets deleted if you leave your organization and you want things to keep running, right? You also want people to be able to support your work while you're on vacation or whatever. My site is called Power BI, so this is the part that I want. I'm gonna copy this and then paste it in here and click OK. The UI for this is a little bit strange. You always want to choose this transform data option here first. Don't do combine and transform because that's going to try and combine all of the files in your SharePoint site. The transform data. So here's what we're starting with. We need to filter this down to only the files that we want before we do the expansion action. There's two methods to do this. There's our SharePoint.files that we're using right now and there's SharePoint.contents. Some people swear that SharePoint.contents is faster, but I tried both with over a million rows and they both seemed like they were the same speed to me. So let's do both of these. I'm gonna duplicate this. And so we have two to work on. So this one is gonna be SharePoint files. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do for SharePoint.files is to filter down the folder path. It can be kind of hard to see what's going on in this column because there's not enough space for it. So if for whatever reason you're having a really hard time getting the proper path for this, it's a lot easier in SharePoint.contents. We'll get to that in a second. But for me, I just want that CSV folder. So that's this one here. And then we also want to filter on the extensions. So I have CSVs and XLSX files in this folder. I only want the CSVs. You can also filter on the file name contains some particular value, but I want all of these, so I'm not gonna do that. So next step is to combine the files. So that's this double down arrow icon right here in the content column. So if I click that, it's gonna expand all the content of all those files and then click okay. So that added a bunch of query steps for us down the list here. It also added a folder of little helper queries over here. That's totally normal. That's just what it does. It basically looks at one of your files and then expands all of them based on the content in that one file that it looked at. So if you want to try SharePoint.contents versus SharePoint.files, our duplicated query is here. Right now it's using SharePoint.files as the source. If we change this word files to contents and click OK, we get a list of everything that is in our SharePoint site. So our documents for this particular example are in the shared documents library. That's this one here. If you have multiple libraries in your SharePoint site, it might be in a different one. So I'm gonna click on this word table next to shared documents. And then we're going to navigate through the folder structure in our library. So for me, there was a folder called CSVs in the top level of the library. So I'm gonna click into the table link next to that folder. And now we're in the same view that we were at before. So I can filter on the extension here to only CSVs. And I don't need to filter on the path because we've already navigated to the right path. We can just use this expand all down in the exact same way as before and click OK. So I'm going to load these so you can kind of get an idea of loading speed. And then we're going to talk about optimization for large file sources. So these files have a bunch of errors in them. It's because there's some type errors in the source. I have another video on how to prevent and troubleshoot errors. I'm gonna to link to it in the video description. So you can see that the SharePoint files query and the SharePoint contents query loaded at about the same rate. There's over a million files in each. It took maybe 30 seconds, if that. These are CSV sources. When you're working with exports from systems that are large files, as a source, usually CSVs are going to perform much better than .xlsx files. There's a Chris Webb blog post about this topic. I'll link to it in the video description. You can't insert a table in a CSV like you can in XLSX file. So XLSX files are still the way to go for files where you have people manually editing fields. CSVs are more of a static file thing. It's a really good idea if you're working with CSVs to use incremental refresh. So assuming that you are getting fresh files, say once a month or once a week or once a day or whatever, the incremental refresh will let you only pull the new files, which will make your 
query refresh a lot faster up to one of the very first steps here where you're just looking at the broad information about the files. There's a column on here you can use for the incremental refresh. So that would be the date created column. You want to use a date column that's not changing all the time, but it does need to be a date field that's at the file level, not something inside your file. I'll link to the documentation on the incremental refresh. Basically, you just add a couple of parameters to your data set that filter on this column. And then when the refresh runs, it gets whatever is new. You would want to use this when the historical data isn't being modified. Other things you can do for optimization, um, generally it's better to limit the number of transformation steps you're doing inside of Power Query, because once you've expanded those files, none of the actions that you're taking are going to fold. So they're going to be slow, basically. You can use data flows to kind of break up the processing of the files a little bit. So connect to the raw files in a data flow and then do your transforms while you're connected to the data flow in Power BI Desktop. I'll show you how to copy and paste these queries over to a data flow in a second. Um, but I also want to talk about file sizes. So a smaller number of large files is better than a large number of small files speed wise. All right, so data flows. Data flows are essentially a cloud hosted Power Query that you can connect to in Power BI. So if I take all of these queries, I'm just going to shift, select all of them and then do control C to copy. Then in Power BI in my workspaces, so this needs to be done in something that is not your personal workspace. Your personal workspace won't let you make data flows in it. Go to new item. Here's your data flow options. Gen 1 is going to be the not premium option. So if you don't have premium, you're going to want to go with this one. Gen 2 is premium. So premium per user will allow it. So I'm going to go with Gen 1 because I don't have premium. In here, you just click on add tables. And if you haven't already made your query in Power BI Desktop, you can select your source here. What I'm going to do is go for blank query because I already made my queries. I just want to copy and paste them over. So I'm just going to click next to go through and load the main screen here. Here's my blank query. I can delete this and then just paste in from Power BI Desktop all of those queries we just made. I'm going to click into this queries window here and then control V on my keyboard and they will all load. It wants credentials. This is totally normal. It needs to know how to authenticate with your data source. So I'm going to add a connection. And the authentication type needs to be organizational account for SharePoint sources. Privacy level, you can set if you want to. This doesn't do anything other than limit which kinds of data can be combined. So I'm going to set it to organizational and connect. So our two SharePoint queries are here. If I go in and open those up, I can see the steps. So from here, all you do is save and close this and give it a name. So as an FYI, the access for these data flows is at the workspace level. If you have other people that need to use them as a source, you need to give them access to the workspace, which is not the way things are normally shared in Power BI. I just wanted to point that out. Here's our two tables. I'm going to close this. And you can set up a refresh schedule in the same way that you do for any other data source. You do need to run a refresh before the data will show up. So I'm going to run one here. So now if I go back to the desktop app, I can use that data flow as a source. If I go to get data and then choose data flows from the list. The data flow is going to appear in the workspace that I have it saved to as a folder. So it wants me to sign in, open up the workspace name, and here's our data flow and here's our tables. If we connect to one of these and go to transform data, this is the new query we just added. The pipes to the data flow source are much larger than connecting to the SharePoint source. SharePoint will throttle you heavily when you are pulling data from lots and lots of files. So you can essentially split your processing load between the data flow and the desktop. You end up with, I don't want to say twice, can't, I don't want to give a number because it'll be wrong, but like twice as much processing power versus doing it only through the desktop app. The downside is if you want to change anything about your query, you have to go in and update the data flow and refresh it before the changes will be reflected here. If you're using the same file source more than once, you having it in a data flow is a good idea generally because then you have a single source of truth, right? So let's talk about errors for a second. Query errors are very common when you're using files as a source in Power BI. That's because they're easier to edit than a database. They also don't have a lot of enforced structure to them. So to avoid issues with file sources, you want to avoid renaming things as much as possible. They're fixable errors, right? You can just go in and update your references, but it's kind of a pain. 
I have another video on this topic. I'm going to link to it in the video description. I'll also throw out there that SharePoint lists, if you're going to be having people edit bits and pieces of your data, SharePoint lists actually work very well for this because you can control exactly what people can and can't do in them. So for example, if you give your users contribute access instead of edit access to a SharePoint list, they won't be able to change your column settings or column names or delete columns or add columns. Let me show you that real quick. So here's a SharePoint list. Microsoft lists are the same thing as SharePoint lists. If I go to the gear menu up here while I'm in my list and go to list settings and then click on permissions for this list, if I stop inheriting permissions, so stop inheriting means stop doing whatever is happening at the site level because I only want to set it for this list, not for everything in the site. So click on that. It gives me a scary message. I say OK. Now I can change my members group. So that's probably the bulk of my users from edit. So edit allows you to create and delete lists and list columns. I'm going to edit their user permission with a button up here and set it to contribute and uncheck the box next to edit and click OK. So that really limits what they can do with this list. You also have a lot more data validation options in SharePoint lists um, because the columns have actual types. So you can't put text in a date field, for instance. You also have things like people fields, which are validated against the Microsoft 365 user profiles. So you won't get misspelled email addresses and things like that or misspelled names. I'm going to be putting this video along with all of my other file source videos into a playlist so that they're all in one place. Probably try and put that in the end screen if I'm clever. <laughs> we'll see. So thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day.